I thought we had come to the end of Brahms' music, but apparently that's not the case. David, what's up for today? Matt, we only uh, played the works of his latest period, the Opus 76, 79, 116, 17, 18, and 19. Now we go back to the early works of his career, and it will continue with the small pieces, and they are the four ballads, by no means played as frequently as the later works. Now, uh, originally, I asked you, I think, uh, a long time ago, what is a ballad exactly? <sighs> Gee, uh, a ballad is uh, almost only a title. In Chopin, it was a complex form. In Liszt, it was uh, fairly complex. Brahms, though, is using it as the title itself, a narrative, a narrative poem. He is... He is discussing something. Uh, you will hear that narrative element in the first work, the D minor ballad, which is perhaps the best known of these four pieces, and uh, it's based on a Scottish ballad. Rather gloomy work, and very characteristic of Brahms. The Opus 10 ballad in D minor and the performance is by Arthur Rubenstein.
Arthur Rubinstein in the D minor ballade of Johannes Brahms, 1833 to 1897. I would say this work is the product of the 23 to 24 year old Brahms. Did he change, well maybe I should ask a double question again. How did he work when, at the time he wrote this? In other words, uh, did he compose at the keyboard per se, or was it all I don't think Brahms out? composed at the keyboard, but I'm glad you asked that question, because okay. I, have, there we go. I have a letter here <laughs> that Brahms wrote to a Mr. Henschel. And uh, I think there's nothing more interesting than in reading or discussing with a composer, painter, writer, or any, anyone that's creative, what the process is something that really can't be analyzed, but Brahms is doing it for himself. It's certainly a personal thing. He writes, There is no real creating without hard work. That which you would call invention, that is to say, a thought, is simply an inspiration from above, for which I am not responsible, which is no merit of mine. Yes, it is a present, a gift, which I ought even to despise until I have made it my own by right of hard work. And there need be no hurry about that either. It is as with the seed corn. It germinates unconsciously and in spite of ourselves. When I, for instance, have found the first phrase of a song, I might shut the book there and then, go for a walk, do some other work, and perhaps not think of it again for months. Nothing, however, is lost. If afterward I approach the subject again, it is sure to have taken shape. I can now really begin to work at it. Hmm. So he does consider the idea of the theme of the of the piece or the, the musical thought as a gift. He calls it that. Isn't that a splendid concept? Yeah. But it's just given to him, and then he has to work with it. It's and just the then term. hard work, as he says, it's a gift, but he, he, he should even despise it because he has to make it his by right of hard work. Did Remember when we discussed Chopin, how he, he had that original theme and how he would put it through uh, everything possible to make sure that's it, the, the refining process of, uh, of a great artist is is, of course different with each individual, but I think that hard work is uh, certainly in great constructive musicians like Brahms. Schubert, of course, uh, the myth that he didn't work, that he was just a magic fountain, he was indeed that. He would get up in the morning, Schubert, with uh, glasses on, his spectacles, because he didn't want to waste a moment looking for them, because the uh, the magic creative force uh, was already going through his brain and instantly uh, with glasses on he'd be able to uh, jump out of bed and start composing. Well there's been this thing said that people uh, come up with great ideas in their sleep or uh, that you should get up in the middle of the night and write notes. Did Brahms ever do this or Schubert for that I don't matter? know but that brings uh, a story of Berlioz to mind uh, where uh, he was extremely poor and he was doing a lot of hack work and copying uh, other people's music when he was at the conservatory and he had a dream with a full-fledged symphony which he uh, um, uh, when he got up said uh, let's see now I have to make a living at this time he had just married and uh, I, I am starving. I don't have time to try to start notating this marvelous symphony. It's going to be lost to the world. <laughs> uh, so he went and did his hack work, and uh, he, he, he talks of this in his memoirs. And, of course, Berlioz is a flamboyant, phenomenal character. And uh, uh, Tartini also, the Devil's Trill Sonata, came from a dream. But he said the uh, creation that came from uh, the, the actual consciousness could not come up to the divine beauty, as he put it, of the sonata he heard in his dream. I myself have had... Uh, Musical dreams? Absolutely. Uh, I have composed whole sonatas uh, by uh, Bergmuller, obscure composers, and, and, <laughs> no. I, and I will actually get up, I will, I will think, do I know that work? No, I don't know that work. I s really swear I don't. And I will say, well, what kind of quality is it? Usually poor. <laughs> and Mendelssohnian, in a way. <laughs> I can't imagine. Well, dreams are interesting, and all people that I think uh, uh, are involved with music ha have dreams. I, th I think music is uh, part of our dreams. 
And it's a gift, you say, as uh, he said particularly, it's, uh, this thing that comes in your sleep or in your subconscious and just sort of grows. Well, here, then you here have a, to work on yeah, it. Yeah, he was discussing here a, a text. Well, the text instantly brought some musical uh, germ to mind. Schubert could be in a... Um, in a restaurant, and he, the famous story of uh, his writing uh, an immortal song on a menu. Which I'm not familiar with. What's that no. story? Uh, that's it, essentially. Yeah, he, he, he just wrote. It, it, it just came out. All he had to do was uh, a bad poem, a good poem. They're almost musical freaks in a way, I suppose. Well, uh, what is genius? Is it an abnormality? Oh, it's, it's a stunning um, concept, the whole thing. No, I can see that. But of I mean, course, it's a, it's a, uh, it takes, uh, uh, in someone like a Brahm, it takes tremendous work. Now, the, the composers that aren't critical usually are have a very flawed output. Chopin does not have a flawed output. Does Brahms in your estimation? No, not at all. Who, uh, just out of curiosity, who does and who doesn't? A flawed output? Oh, my goodness, Schumann. Flawed? List. Flawed. Most people, yeah. Beethoven, Bach. No, but, uh, Beethoven is is hardly great at all times. Uh, however, the 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 uh, astounding number of masterworks. No, Bach is n not a flawed output. Mozart has many potboilers to his credit. Just because it's Mozart, that doesn't mean everything he wrote. He he was writing to uh, to survive. He himself would uh, put certain price tags on his uh, German dance as well. This is uh, this is worth more than. Um, uh, eight dollars. Uh, this is a ten dollar work. I mean, he could write them at will. As so, well, it's complicated, and sometimes it, it, it's economic. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly enough, uh, with Mozart, he was uh, um, always writing to order. This was, of course, the 18th century uh, spirit of the patron uh, gives you uh, money and you, you give him a, a work of entertainment often, the divertimenti mm -hmm. of Haydn and uh, Mozart and so forth, hundreds of works that were uh, heard, played by instrumentalists while they were um, supping, so to speak. And uh, Mozart uh, rarely composed without uh, money for mm -hmm. it. The, the, the art for art's sake thing uh, hadn't come along. Well, Mozart uh, composed the last three symphonies uh, I think in 1789, the, the famous 39th, 40th, and the Jupiter. This is interesting for Mozart, for he never heard the works. Why? No one had commissioned them. In other words, they were written as pure music, but were unmarketable, as it were. Right. They, they weren't bought to be played. Uh, his piano concerti were uh, commissioned for subscription concerts where he would be the soloist. And uh, the time where music... Uh, practices would look back and uh, take works of the past was not uh, at its height until the 19th century. So here is Mozart, right? He's still having two years to live in his uh, uh, short life of only 35 years, uh, writing the, the immortal th last three symphonies, not hearing them. This is perhaps, uh, as Alfred Einstein I think wrote of this incident one of the the uh, beginnings of romanticism the the idea that you are going to definitely write just for the need hmm. and they they didn't uh, you probably heard it in mind's ear if that's uh, yeah. well the, Mozart was composing at all times while he was playing billiards he was composing and he loved to play billiards anyway Brahms uh, was composing at all times too was Brahms a good businessman in terms of yes. selling his works to publishers absolutely very good and left in a state of over one hundred thousand dollars although he uh, as we said this is old dollars yeah, yeah. I mean it's a well, million now or a couple I, million. I don't know but he was a very wealthy man and uh, his tastes were simple he liked to play with toy soldiers he liked children uh, he and yet he never married well that's that's uh, a great psychological problem in his mm -hmm. life uh, um, uh, women, women that would that would come close to him, uh, he would, uh, for various reasons, uh, some uh, for perhaps fear of of involvement and relationship taking away from from his work. However, there is other aspects. One of them being that uh, he. Uh, in his childhood, to make extra money for the family, he played 
at the Hamburg, and it was a rough place, the Hamburg uh, waterfront areas in uh, dives and brothels. And uh, who knows exactly how this uh, affected his psyche in regards to, uh, to uh, a relationship. Yes. Didn't seem to bother women. Scott Joplin. <laughs> No, uh, but in this Brown's case, this, this, sensitive yeah, well, this was uh, the black man, Scott Joplin, right. who uh, uh, the, the music he was composing I at that time, this was looked down upon by uh, the white establishment. Mm -hmm. And where else could the black man play mm -hmm. his music but in the, uh, the dives uh, and the, the, the uh, brothels, saloons, mm -hmm. and casinos? So this was uh, uh, social. I see. And uh, economic thing. Anyway, uh, it's all so complex. Now, let's truly get back to music. I've been babbling. Uh, the D minor ballade in a performance by Wilhelm Kempf in a rather new release. Wilhelm Kempf in the D minor ballade, Opus 10, Johannes Brahms.
Well, do you have Earl Wilde ready to go for the Scottish yes. Ballade in D minor? Yes, I've been actually looking forward to that uh, for the simple reason that uh, Earl Wilde has been, by pianist friends of mine, been very highly regarded in terms of his technique, and I suspect this is a work that, uh, although it may not be as taxing, uh, technically speaking, it certainly uh, requires a lot in terms of uh, interpretive qualities. I indeed, yes. Um, you called it the Scottish Ballade? Yeah, it's... I see uh, that on the jacket it's actually called the Edward Ballade. R yes, it's... Uh, Can you tell us how that came to be? Well, th the Ballade is by a Scot, and uh, it's... I, I, I'll have to look that up. Okay, that's <laughs> a right? bad question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I should know that. So... Let, let's, <clears throat> let's hear Earl Wilde.
Earl Wilde in the D minor ballad opus 10 of Brahms. Did you find the information, Matt, on the... Uh, uh, yeah, it was on the Earl Wilde jacket. Apparently there was a collection of folk songs, of Scottish songs published by one, or collected by one, Herder. Mm -hmm. No other information given. Mm -hmm. And the ballad was simply called Edward, about a mm -hmm. man named Edward. Yes, and it's uh, obviously a sad poem. And, uh, well, what should we do now? Well, Another you want to go on to the I next think. ballad? Yes, I I'll think so. One. The next ballad is in D major, very lovely piece. It's almost popular. It's played frequently for the ballads. Mm -hmm. Let's hear a performance by, uh, we can, yeah, let's do Kempf. Thank you. 
Wilhelm Kempf in the second ballade, opus 10, in the key of D major. That's a rather recent recording. I thought he'd given up recording some years ago. Kempf, no, he's, he's hard at work all the time. Because all the records I have seem to be beat up and scratchy, but again, that's my collection, and uh, my impression must be quite wrong. Some of my favorite performances of the Beethoven sonatas happen in Kempf's playing. And, of course, he is a great performer of Brahms, Schubert. Well, I gather that he's a German, obviously, with a, with yeah. a name like that, and recording for a German a, company. I a fine human being. I've heard that. He looks like a fine person. You know, he, he's had a great career, Kempf, and uh, in America, only for the first time, uh, seven or so years ago. In other words, he avoided this country all that time? I don't know if it was avoidance on his, you know, uh, part. Mm -hmm. However, uh, not here until until just a short while ago. Compared to such a gigantically long career, he's mm -hmm. he's certainly seventy-eight or or more. And he still uh, maybe, seems quite adept at playing. Yeah. Uh, oh yes. That was the D major ballad, and James Honecker writes, the theme so gentle, so winning, so heartfelt is sung in octaves, and although the intervals are not favorable for a legato, yet a perfect legato is demanded. The first page of this ballade is magnificent. The second theme in B minor is in strong contrast rhythmically, in content being stern and imperious. I confess the molto staccato leggero is a bit of Brahms that always puzzles me. I find analogies in Beethoven in those mysterious pianissimi in his symphonies and concertos where the soul is almost freed from the earthly vestige and for a moment hovers about in the twilight of uncertain tonalities and rhythms. That's what James Honecker says about the D major ballade. And we have a performance now by the late Julius Ketchen, who has performed all of them from volume four of the complete works for piano of Brahms.
Julius Katchen in the D major ballade, Opus 10, by Brahms. We'll have to pause right now before we go on to our next version. I think we have time for one more performance of this ballade. Good. Uh, who shall, shall we play, Matt? Well, we have a choice of either Earl Wilde or Arthur Rubinstein, and I think... Well, since we haven't had much of Earl Wilde... Do you want to do that now? and you're curious about listening to him, let's hear Earl Wilde in the D major ballad.
Earl Wilde playing the D major ballade of Brahms, and that's opus 10, number 2. On our next program, we'll complete the ballades for sure, two more in the opus 10, and in the Brahms series we still have to cover the delightful waltzes, the three sonatas, the F minor being gigantic, about a 40-minute work, uh, the sets of variations, and the highlights of the variations of Brahms being the Paganini, a tour mm -hmm. de force just unbelievable in its technical difficulty, and the wonderful Handel variations. Also, we have the waltzes. What else? Let's see. Oh, the uh, Hungarian dances. Ah, four hands. Right. We should do those. And I think that's about it for the moment. <laughs> We've covered it, possibly. Yes, and we're out of time anyway, even if there were anything Matt, else. Matt, thank you very much. Thank you.